But tonight, uh, we are privileged to uh, have with us some young men. Uh, I'm, they're all young, which is good because this project is taking a lot of years and will take a lot of years. Anybody guessing as to how many more years this is going to take before it's all done? Uh, we're supposed to be wrapped up in about nine to ten years. Okay. So. And, and when, what was the year of the first volume again? 2008. 2008. So I was just, uh, Matt Godfrey, who is the uh, managing historian of the Joseph Smith Papers, be one of our speakers, but I was asking him uh, about the reaction that I've heard so much about from others who have done the major papers of prominent individuals in our history, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, others, and they are pretty much astounded at the, the scope and the volume of this project. and. Um, how quickly the volumes are coming out. I mean, some of you may think they take a long time, but compared to the glacial pace of some of the other papers that have been done, this is astoundingly fast. And uh, they're amazed at the professional quality of not only the editing, but the, the bookmaking, the, the actual physical product, and how many books have sold. Uh, some of these papers that have been done over by prestigious institutions, publishers, um, they'll sell maybe a few hundred copies of uh, the volumes. Um, this set, uh, the ongoing series, has already sold tens and tens of thousands of copies. Um, I was asking which one probably sold the least and we think it's the Revelations and Translations, the library edition, just the smaller edition. Um, but even that has sold a few thousand copies. So it's really amazing. And those of you who have come to these in the past or have heard me talk about the Joseph Smith Papers project, um, I've already heard my me on the soapbox, but, and I'm certainly not alone in this feeling, but this project is of monumental importance in Mormon history, in my opinion. Um, what's made it possible, uh, I mean, I think it's a series of miracles, but, um, but Larry Miller uh, provided the initial funding, and without him, I don't think we would have had these volumes, and they, or at least they certainly wouldn't have turned out to be uh, as nice as they are and as, as well done as they are. Um, to provide that crucial funding, and I'm I'm uh, really pleased that the church has backed this project and has made it possible and spent countless man hours, person hours, and dollars to to produce these books, and they are of as I said monumental importance. This uh, our history is being told in a way that it's never been told before, with candor and with honesty and with preciseness that we simply haven't seen in past generations. Uh, it's, a, it's a new era. And uh, I'm very grateful to have with us, and they'll, as I understand it, they'll speak in this order, uh, Mike McKay, uh, who is co-editor of a number of volumes uh, in the document series. I don't even know if these guys know exactly how many documents, volumes, there are going to be eventually. So far we have two. Um, I'm not going to give you long introductions. Unfortunately, I haven't spent as much time with, with these men as I have a number of the authors that we've had here before. and uh, they're, they're up and coming scholars and, uh, uh, and they, they are involved in various volumes have been and will be involved in various volumes in this series, and I'll let you hear from them uh, which ones. But uh, So first, Mike McKay will, will speak to us, and then Matt Godfrey, who I just learned, I wondered at first, but I didn't know his parents, Ken and Audrey Godfrey, many of you are probably familiar with some of their work, Women's Voices and a number of other uh, things. Uh, 
up in the, they're up in the Logan area. Uh, so he comes from, he was born of goodly parents. Yes. And he's been uh, at the church uh, his, history library for the last three years. And as I mentioned earlier, is the managing historian of the papers and co-editor of a number of volumes. And then uh, Mark Ashurst McGee, uh, that, that I've known for several years, um, is a, this is one of his specialties, document analysis and, and editing. And uh, these guys have more education than I could even dream of. Uh, and uh, if and, and so in that that's the order that they will speak in, and then we will have questions and answers after that. If we're lucky, uh, Garrett Dirk Mott will he's got another obligation right now, but we're hoping that he's going to come. And then after we finish um, listening to them and you ask your questions, uh, then we'll have them sign. And so we'd invite you to bring your to make your purchases at the front and then, uh, and then have them sign and chat with them. And they're going to stick around for a while and invite you to have some of the goodies that we've provided. Um, any questions before I turn the time over to anything at all? Okay, so first we'll hear from, uh, I guess officially, Michael Hubbard McKay. Mike. Uh, and then Matt, and then Mark. It's like putting a corsage on at the dance, so right. make sure he doesn't stab you. Uh, let's see how that. Is that Can you hear ahead? that okay? Or not? You might Should I just hold it up? Want to hold it. Yeah, that's fine. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not nearly the as good looking a prom date as most, but. Um, so before Mike uh, starts talking about D1, I was just going to take a couple minutes to say something uh, generally about the Joseph Smith Papers. Uh, the project itself. Um, many of you are probably aware of, of much of this, um, but of course the, the papers project is our attempt to uh, publish comprehensively uh, all Joseph Smith documents uh, that are extant um, and that we've located. And we're going to publish those either in hard copy or on our website. So there's kind of a dual component to the project. There are the print volumes uh, but there's also our website uh, where we have uh, many documents already posted there. I think we're through 1841 in terms of the documents that we've, that we've been able to, to post online. So the website's kind of out in front of uh, the print volumes. And our print volumes uh, are being published in six different series. Uh, there's the journal series. Uh, where we have two volumes of the journal series that have already been published. And journals volume three, we hope, will, will be out in uh, 2015. Uh, and that will be the concluding volume for that series. There's the Revelations and Translations series. We've published two volumes in that. Uh, the third volume will actually be... Uh, the Printer's Manuscript of the Book of Mormon, and that should be out in 2015 as well. That will actually be two separate volumes uh, to cover the, the Printer's Manuscript. Um, but that will be out in uh, 2015, like I said. Um, we also have the Histories series. There's two volumes published in that, and those are the only two volumes in that series. Uh, there is the Documents series, which we'll be talking more about tonight. Uh, where we just published the first two volumes in that. That's kind of the core series of the, of the project. There will probably be uh, probably around 12 volumes in the document series when everything's uh, done with that. There's also the legal and business uh, series, uh, and the first volume of that we hope will be out in a few years. Uh, those volumes are actually being edited uh, by Jeff Walker and Gordon Madsen and Jack Welch. Uh, those are the three scholars that uh, are working on those. And then finally, there's our administrative series, which will have one uh, volume in print, and that will be the uh, Council of 50 volume that we hope will be out in the next uh, three years or so. 
Uh, so that's just kind of a brief overview. Um, and like I said, tonight we'll be talking about the two volumes in the document series uh, that have uh, kicked off that series. Um, okay, so uh, I think first what I need to tell you is, so with Documents Volume 1, this has been this, this labor of love for an, a number of people. Um, it's this, uh, me included, I certainly have just loved being a part of this volume. Um, but there's numerous people that have been involved, and, and the amount of work that goes into one of these volumes is, is just something that is, you can't really calculate it. The number of people that work on it and the amount of work that gets done in a single volume is, is pretty amazing. Um, but I, I, I've been uh, grateful to be a part of this, this specific volume, partly because it addresses uh, uh, almost all of the foundational issues of the church. Um, it, it, un, it, it sort of, uh, it, the documentary editing goes into topics like uh, restoration of the priesthood, translation of the Book of Mormon, um, the numerous angelic visits that happen, um, you know, the first 56 revelations that are recorded, um, uh, and it goes over some that weren't recorded also, um, and, and also the establishment of the church, the call to move to Ohio, and then it ends just after the June 3rd conference where the high priesthood is restored. Um, and so you have all of these, these fantastic uh, restoration uh, events, um, and we were able to dig into each of these. Some of the documents, it, you'll, you'll get this, these great insights into some of the, the stories behind these restoration events that come in a, in a massive footnote or sometimes in the introductions. Um, but one of the things that I think helps, that's different with the, with the document series that's helpful to know, that is also easier, I think, to engage, um, it, uh, each of the documents is included. It has this historical introduction before each of the documents. And then the, the traditional very heavy annotation that the Joseph Smith papers engage in to, to really get down to the, the root of what the document is saying. Um, and, and that's the whole intention. We're looking at these documents in, in great detail. Um, and then we're also seeing, you know, what, the, what happens from looking at these documents in such great detail. Um, and there's been numerous debates. I think you know, one, of the, um, one of the documents that's in Documents Volume 1 is um, Doctrine and Covenants Section 19. This is one of the biggest changes. Um, it also is reflected in the new headings of the Doctrine and Covenants. But we changed the dating from uh, a March 1830 date to a summer of 1829 date. Um, and this, this came not because we found necessarily new documents, but as we had numerous scholars come in and we would debate with them over and over. We looked at the, at the documents over and over to try to uncover, especially what the text in itself tells us. Um, what does the text tell us and how can we date this? Um, and, and the dating in particular is probably one of the hardest things that happens in the documentary editing world. Um, and so this particular document, um, by changing the date, and, the, and that's the only thing that's changed in the, in the heading of the Doctrine and Covenants, is the date. You know, it's, a, uh, it's about six to eight months earlier um, that this revelation is received. It changes the whole atmosphere. It actually changes the negotiations with, for printer, uh, with printers. Um, it changes it and, it and it opens up the concept of what is Martin Harris's role in, in the publication of the Book of Mormon. And, and these, these specific details are foundational for the Restoration. How does the Book of Mormon really come forth? Um, what is Martin Harris's role? Um, and uh, while we weren't trying to justify Martin Harris's position on, in, in this, um, with the new dating it actually makes, it demonstrates Martin Harris's role um, that he was actually going to give up all of his property. Um, and so we got, when we got into this specific document, um, there's many telltale signs that can connect to different contextual analysis. Um, but one of the biggest things that we were looking at is the traditional story says, you know, basically Martin Harris used this, this, 
his, his farm as collateral so that they would begin printing the Book of Mormon. And then as the Book of Mormon sold, as they sold these copies of the Book of Mormon, he would then get his money back. He would eventually give his money back. Um, but when you look really closely at it, um, one of the things that was really striking to me as I was looking at these documents really carefully is that you have E.B. Grandin um, um, publishing things um, in his newspaper um, about, um, about uh, uh, loans that have been given out. Um, these, what we would call, you know, we get a mortgage and then we put a lien on it. Um, and demonstrating that even his brother, E.B. Grandin's brother, is doing this. So he, he obtains this property um, and he actually, it looks like it's just a lease or, or you know, where he's just turning it over but he, he still has ownership over it. But in fact, he's getting that property and they have this time to pay back the property. Um, and so what's happening is they really are turning over the property. The person owns that property. And this is what happens with Martin Harris. He actually turns over all of his property. Um, he turns all of his property over to E.B. Grandin. Um, and one of the striking things that emerges, um, before it seems like it's chastising Martin Harris, like he hasn't actually sold his land. You know, uh, sell your land, Martin Harris. Well, in fact, he does not possess his land after August 25th. Um, he doesn't own the land, and he's actually turned it over completely. Um, and the very, the note, for example, like currency at that time, it doesn't work exactly the same. We have these notes, and it's currencies backed by a bank. And it's this faith-based system. Um, they actually have, there's still an exchange of notes where IOUs, um, they, they act as power. Well, um, as they mortgage this farm, that very note is worth the money that's being paid. So it's literally like giving him money. Uh, it's not as liquid as cash, but it is very much money when he hands over that document that is the mortgage of all of his property. Now, the reason we know that he uses it and is that it is very liquid is for the fact that before, like he has this, this period of time where he can actually pay E.B. Grandin and, and get his, his, his property back. The problem is um, E.B. Grandin actually sells his property. He sells the mortgage before that time period ever comes. And someone else takes charge of Martin Harris's mortgage. And so this is a big sign that something different is happening. The fact that E.B. Grandin sells the property. He d it's not even time to sell. He doesn't have to sell. He turns it over for gold. He sells his property, the mortgage of Martin Harris, for gold. And so if you look at contextually, so you start looking at the, the actual text in DNC 19, you start to realize that, in fact, it's telling him, sell all of your property except that which you're going to give to your family. Um, and so in 1828, um, you have this deal where it's essentially um, the dowry rights of Lucy Harris. So on the 12th of April, 1828, this is the time where Martin starts uh, the process of translating with Joseph Smith. Um, he turns over a third of his property. There's a third of his property that goes to Lucy Harris, and they do this back deal. It's almost like they had the, the, an essential divorce in 1825, and he signs the document in, on April 12, 1828, essentially assuring Lucy Harris that even if Martin Harris gives all his land, she will still have her individual property, and there isn't a divorce. Uh, getting a divorce is something that is, is rarely done. It's very difficult to get a divorce, and it's very expensive. And it takes all this time. But um, they have, um, the, the dowry rights are given to her um, officially, signed on April 12, 1828. Additionally, he has this other piece of property that's in Palmyra, and that's actually sold on the 23rd of 1829. And that's about the time that the revelation is given. Give up all of that, your land, except that which you have, which, which you are going to give to your family. So you have a third of the property given to, to Lucy Harris, and then you have this other portion of property that's given to Flanders Dyke. Now Flanders Dyke um, married um, Lucy Harris Jr. in 1828, 
and that piece of property is given to his son-in-law. And so now you have a context for what that revelation is actually talking about. So knowing that there is an official sale of the property through the mortgage that E.B. Grandin sells, for the revelation to have come in, in March 1830, um, if that were to, to be what happened, then it would be saying, sell the land which you no longer own, and, and, and then you'll be blessed. Well, the fact of the matter is, the commandment would mean nothing because the property is not his. He does not possess that property. He has no right to the property. And E.B. Grandin, in fact, sells the mortgage to someone else. Now, this is, this is deeply important because all of a sudden, <coughs> D&C 19 becomes expressly important to an 1829 context. Um, furthermore, the reason other, this is just to kind of get a little bit deeper, um, the, it, the, the concept, and people have often said, well, there's this story in Joseph Knight Sr., he, he writes this history, I wouldn't say a well-written history, but he writes this history, and in the history he describes when he takes Joseph Smith up to Palmyra um, near April 6th, you know, they, they arrive the Book of Mormon, the first copy comes off on March 26, 1830. Well, they, um, uh, Joseph Knight takes him up there, and then he explains that there's this, there's this, uh, they run in to Martin Harris, and Martin Harris says, you know, the books won't sell. He's upset. The books won't sell. And he says, I want a revelation. Give me a revelation. And the what Joseph's response is, according to Joseph Knight Sr., is, you have a revelation. Fulfill the one that you've got. And then he says, we, we went and we stayed there, and Joseph Knight Sr. is there, and he says, well, uh, Martin Harris keep pressuring him in that evening. The next morning, he woke up and he was still pressuring Joseph. And then uh, he actually explains that he leaves, and he assumes that Joseph Smith gave him DNC 19 at that point. And the reason we know that is because he says, and Joseph Smith gave him a revelation, but he says, I wasn't there. And that revelation, he goes to the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, and he opens up the Doctrine and Covenants and puts the page number from the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants in his history. Now, if you look through the rest of his history, he only gives page numbers and identifies the revelation when he wasn't there, but he needed to talk about it. And what he does is he goes to the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, he puts in a page number in his history, and then goes on, because he doesn't know anything about it. Um, and so these are all the big telltale signs that say, this March 1830 date, it, it, it doesn't fit the context. The, the, um, the arguments that have gone before that base the dating on that specific date are based upon documents where you can't justify that that is the date, um, Joseph Knight Sr. being the primary case. And, and so with that in mind, uh, we've redated the Doctrine and Covenants section 19 to the summer of 1829, which then it's telling Martin Harris, pay for the Book of Mormon, pay for the printing. And it says that right up, pay for the printing. And, and so... Um, with that in mind, um, there are also some negotiations that go on before that. Uh, uh, in June, they go, they go to Rochester, um, and you have I individuals telling Martin Harris, don't do it. Um, you have uh, two people in Rochester that say don't do it, and in fact, even E.B. Grandin publishes an article in late June that says, I, I, you know, I just can't, I can't take his money. This is a terrible book. So in late June, E.B. Grandin is actually arguing against publishing the book. Um, and so you get E.B. Grandin's brother-in-law, Pomeroy Tucker, who reflects back and said, Martin Harris was going to pay for the book, but then he had second thoughts. Remember, this is his brother-in-law, who's actually working in E.B. Grandin's press shop at that point. And he says, he says, yeah, Martin Harris was going to pay for it, but then he had great doubts. All of the printers they went to said, you will, uh, well, to, uh, forgive my, my quote, you will bugger your family if you go out and, and pay, for this, pay for this printing of the Book of Mormon. Um, and so he, he doubts. 
And when he finally goes to Joseph and he says, I, I, I don't know whether I'm going to pay for it or not, that is when Doctrine and Covenants section 19 is given to encourage him to fulfill the deal that he had made with Joseph Smith and the printers to publish the Book of Mormon. And so on the 25th of August, 18, 1829, he then turns over his land um, uh, and, and pays, for the, pays for the printing. But one more point on that, and then I'll... How much longer do I... Should I... A couple more minutes. Okay. Um, uh, the other point is... Uh, So as he as he prints it on in on the or he turns over his land on the twenty fifth of August eighteen twenty nine, um, they then and and this is this is what E. B. Grandin tells um, he says uh, or, or excuse me uh, Gilbert who's the typesetter he said Grandin refused to print a single piece of type the most expensive part of printing the Book of Mormon is this eight hundred dollar bag of type. The, the type wears out, and as you print 5,000 books, the type wears down. And the biggest investment for a printer is the paper and the type. And so, to go out and buy new type, E.B. Grandin says, I will not print the very first page until the Book of Mormon is paid for. Um, and this is after giving an outrageous cost. Most printers in this day make 12%. 12% profit on the books that they publish. And this one, in, it, in its case, he, he has the ability to make up to 50% profit on the Book of Mormon when it's published. Now, that's, that's a huge deal. Now, E.B. Grandin doesn't want to publish the Book of Mormon. He mocks it incessantly all the time that he's actually publishing it, which also demonstrate that he's already paid. Now, take this for example. If he had not been totally paid on the 25th of August, why did he let Abner Cole print on his print press, on his press? Abner Cole, in September, begins to mock the Book of Mormon in his local, in his local newspaper. By the time August comes, he decides to take one of the sheets that are hanging in the office, in E.B. Grandin's <coughs> office, and begin to print it. He prints it and he mocks it. Now that's one thing. So you have this, if Grandin were not paid yet and he was to be paid by the sale of the Book of Mormons, he would then be in deep trouble. He has a person working on his print press who is discouraging the purchase of, Book of, of Books of Mormon. That's a big deal. This could never happen. Furthermore, if that was just an anomaly, Abner Cole, why did he not stop Abner Cole from printing negative things. So you, it comes to March, right? March is the time where we have to sell Book of Mormons. E.B. Grandin doesn't care. At that exact time, Abner Cole publishes the Book of Pukai, the Book of Pukai, mocking the Book of Nephi. Um, and it's describing how awful the Book of Mormon is. Now that doesn't even stop. He continues to print anti-Book of Mormon uh, advertisements in his newspaper for two more years. And so to, to come to the conclusion that Martin Harris only put collateral up and E.B. Grandin hasn't been paid is, is, is impossible. E.B. Grandin would have, li would have lost the biggest investment that he's ever made in his whole life. He's got a brand new print press that he buys, you know, um, just before, uh, just before Cowdery and Joseph start translating, and in that circumstance, <coughs> E.B. Grandin would have been the dumbest man in the whole existence of business had he not been paid up front, because he mocks it, he tries to make sure it doesn't sell, and his whole point was, I've already been paid. In fact, he's so confident that once the Book of Mormon is printed, he sells the mortgage for gold, and he takes his money and he walks away. And in the process, he in fact actually actually gets the in the second floor. It's a three-story building. The second floor where there's this binding. Howard, the binder who works with Grandin, um, actually ends up giving up his his bindery to Joseph Smith. Um, Joseph, or excuse me, Joseph Smith, E.B. Grandin. 
Um, and so you get this, this uh, number one, Grandin wins big time. Grandin gets a lot of money for almost no work. Um, and, and of course, he, he has this higher, the cost of printing. Um, but he makes this great profit off of the Book of Mormon. And Martin Harris paid for it up front. Therefore, with this, I'm sorry, this is like an elongated story about one single thing. And maybe this is the greatest value of the Joseph Smith papers. We care when it was dated. And so, with Doctrine and Covenants section 19, um, it is a summer 1829 document. That is when it was received. And all of that research is gathered up to change one single thing on the, on the revelation. It was dated incorrectly. And largely, the, the arguments were from apologists and uh, people that were uh, uh, church-oriented that were making the arguments about March 1830. And so, I guess that's just one example. I'll leave time for the... I'll, I'll just stop at that point. Um, but uh, just to mention, that's one of the single discoveries. A changing of a date, it really matters. A single date can change the context. It can change the meaning. It can enlighten the document that you're looking at. Um, and I think there has been no other project, to my knowledge, that has cared and been able to fund such an activity. How can you pay a bunch of historians to figure out what the exact date is on each of these specific uh, documents? And so I think the Joseph Smith Papers is, should be, extremely valued for the amount of effort that, that takes to come up with a single document. Document editing takes a long time. It's not a matter of just describing a document. There is so many layers and levels of research that's required to come to the very most basic points, especially in Mormon history, especially in the Docs I period, where you have very few documents and you have the large amount of documents that describe that period that are reminiscent. Some of them are 40 years old. Some of the, even the good ones, some of the David Whitmer ones are 40 <coughs> years old. Um, and so you get to this point where what does it take to really get to know what a document is and what it means? And I would argue it takes a lot more than, than the traditional uh, approach we've had in Mormon history. So I'll end there and pass it over. Well, Mike is definitely a tough act to follow. <laughs> So, uh, um, Mike was the lead editor on uh, Documents Volume 1 and just did really outstanding work uh, in that. Uh, he has an ability to think of things and, and look at documents from a different perspective that I think really influenced uh, heavily um, the interpretations that, that we had about some of these documents in, in Volume 1. Uh, I want to speak briefly about Documents Volume 2 and just give kind of a, a general overview of, of some of the major themes that we see in that volume. And then I want to talk about one uh, insight that uh, perhaps we gained um, from working on this volume. So Documents Volume 2 begins in July of 1831 and it goes through January of 1833. And the very first document in the volume is the revelation that comes to uh, Joseph Smith on July 20th, 1831, while he is in Missouri, that designates Jackson County as the location of the city of Zion. And I think it's very fitting that that's the first document in this volume, because much of this volume deals with the establishment of the city of Zion in Missouri and some of the logistical and administrative issues that that creates for the church. Uh, if you think about it, you know, the church is still relatively young at this time. It's just been organized for over a year when this revelation comes. And suddenly you have two different uh, major centers of church settlement after this revelation comes. Uh, the saints that are gathering to Jackson County, and then also the saints who are in Ohio around where Joseph Smith is. And so we see throughout the volume many examples of uh, some of these issues that establishing the city of Zion create. One of the issues that, that it creates that I think Mark uh, may touch on a little bit more 
um, is the fact that you have kind of two sets of leaders. You have the leaders in Jackson County, Bishop Edward Partridge, John Whitmer, William W. Phelps, and others who are leading the church there. And then you have Joseph Smith in Ohio. Uh, for much of this volume, he's in Hiram, Ohio, uh, where he's working on the, the translation of the Bible. And just trying to figure out how uh, these two groups of leaders interact, who's responsible for what, creates tension during this period. Um, and we see that tension in several different documents in this volume, one of which is uh, what is now section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants. In there, uh, the Lord tells uh, or says that the leaders in Missouri, or the children of Zion, are in need of repentance. And he calls on the leaders in Ohio to call those leaders to repentance. And part of the reason why this happens is because the leaders in Missouri had sent letters to Joseph Smith uh, criticizing aspects of his uh, leadership. John Collier, uh, who was one of the counselors in the bishopric in Missouri, sent Joseph a letter where he accused him of seeking after monarchical power um, in his leadership of the church. And you have several different communications like this. And so from that, uh, we see that this tension arises that has to be dealt with by Joseph and by other leaders in Ohio. And so several documents touch on that. I think one of the other major themes, or one of the other things that we see in this volume, is really uh, a different side of Joseph than I think often gets presented. And that is Joseph's love for his family uh, in this time period. At the time, uh, Joseph had uh, Julia Murdoch and Joseph Murdoch, who uh, he and Emma had adopted. Joseph Murdoch, of course, would die in March of 1832 uh, after the tarring and feathering incident in Hiram. And after that happens, Joseph goes on a trip to Missouri with Sidney Rigdon and Newell K. Whitney. Um, on the way back from that trip, uh, Joseph has to stay in uh, Greenville, Indiana for about six weeks. And this is because Newell K. Whitney uh, had an accident on the trip back. The stage that they were riding in began running away. Whitney tried to leap from the stage. His uh, leg got caught in the wheel and it ended up breaking his leg in, in several places. So while Whitney was recuperating so that he could travel again, Joseph stayed with him in Greenville, Indiana. And he writes a letter to Emma while he's there uh, where he talks to her about various things, but one of the things that he mentions is how much he uh, loves her, how much he wants to be with her and with Julia uh, at the time. Um, and we see this theme come up again uh, just a few months later in October of 1832 when Joseph is back east uh, in New York City with Newell K. Whitney. Um, they're there to, to preach, they're also there so that Whitney can buy goods for his store, his uh, Kirtland store. And there again, Joseph writes another letter to Emma. Uh, both of these letters are included in Documents Volume 2. They're also uh, two of the few letters to Emma that are actually in Joseph's own hand. Um, but in this October letter, he talks about how he's been walking around New York City feeling kind of overwhelmed at the buildings and at the people. And then he comes back to his hotel room and he says that the thoughts of Julia and of Emma flood his mind and he wishes for a moment that he could be with them again. And I think this aspect of Joseph really missing his family, of wanting to be with, with his family uh, when he's traveling, is something that, that we don't always see. So that's another side of Joseph that I think comes across in this volume. Then just briefly, just to cover one insight that I think uh, this, this volume gives us, one of the documents in this volume is Joseph's 1832 history. Uh, which, of course, is the first place, uh, or the first record that we have where he talks about the first vision. Now, we publish that uh, document as part of our History series as well. It's in Histories Volume 1. But in Documents Volume 2, we have this history um, where we can place it more in the context of what is going on at the time that Joseph writes it. Now, Mark uh, did a lot of work to try to narrow down um, when Joseph composed this history. And uh, in Histories Volume 1, 
uh, much of this explanation is given, but we think it came about uh, around the summer of 1832. <coughs> The interesting thing is that when you read Joseph's letter that he writes to Emma from Greenville, Indiana in June of 1832, we see that uh, it appears that while Joseph's in Greenville, the seeds for writing this history actually are planted. Um, Joseph talks in his letter to Emma about how he spends quite a bit of time in a grove of trees in the back of the town, and uh, he spends time there praying to God, and he talks about how, as he's done that, the memories of his past sins and his past follies have come to his mind, but so has come the knowledge that uh, Christ has forgiven him of these sins and of these past follies. Now, the reason why that's interesting is because, of course, when Joseph relates the story of the first vision in this 1832 history, it's in this context of seeing the Lord and having the Lord forgive him of his sins. And so it seems to me that um, at least when he's in Greenville, Joseph begins thinking about writing his history. It's possible as well, although we don't have any uh, firm evidence of this, that while he's spending six weeks in Greenville with really nothing to do there, uh, this was not a planned excursion, this was something that arose suddenly, that perhaps even in Greenville he began uh, making notes or whatever else that would eventually turn into the 1832 history. And I think that's one of the real um, valuable things that come from this document series, is when you have these documents in their historical context, you can gain new insights into them. And I hope that when you read these volumes that some of these insights will come across I hope as well that as you read them that you may gain insights of your own that perhaps we didn't think of as well. Um, but I think we really get a much deeper uh, understanding of these early, this really early period of church history in Documents Volume 1 and Volume 2 that come about as we've really taken the time to study uh, all of these documents in depth. I will turn it over to Mark. I think I'm just going to try to speak really loud. <coughs> I'm just going to try to holler. Can you hear me in the back, Mike? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, I I like I like looking at documents and talking about them when they're when they're right there with you. So I brought a few from the church archives. had to smuggle these out. <laughs> okay, actually these are facsimiles. These these are high grade facsimiles that I had the, the fabricators over at the museum make for me. Okay, actually I, I made these with our photocopier and some scotch tape. <laughs> but I bought three fake documents to talk to, talk about tonight. Okay, this one here is the one that Matt just talked about, this is the June 1832 letter that Joseph Smith wrote to Emma Smith from Greenville, Indiana. And this is just a fantastic document. Um, you know, it's Joseph Smith in his own handwriting writing this personal, uh, emotional letter to his wife. And you've got this great Joseph Smith handwriting. Uh, you can't see it very well, but uh, if, if you actually look, look closely at uh, some of the smudges, you can actually see a little bit of his fingerprint on these images. Didn't come out really well on this, but you can look for those. I'll pass this around, and I'll pass all these around, and if they can make their way back to me at the end of the night, that'd be great. Um, but yeah, you can look for that. There's some fingerprints on here. You got this nice big Joseph Smith signature. This is called a bifolium, which is a, one sheet that's folded in half to make two leaves. And um, as you can see here on the on the back of the second leaf, uh, this served as the wrapper for the envelope. And if you and so 
another interesting thing about this is that um, the addressing here on the, on the addressing panel is in the handwriting of Newell K. Whitney, who was with Joseph Smith, uh, stuck in Greenville with the broken leg. And then you've got this Greenville uh, postmaster notation up here and the postage. You've got, uh, you can see the residue of this adhesive wafer that was used to seal the envelope. And so you can play with this. I'll pass it around, but it folds up like that. And <clears throat> what you can even, what, which when you, before you pass it on, just find the wafer residue here. And then if you look in here, you can see the other half of that wafer. So you can see that's where it was attached together. <clears throat> this document is from the Community of Christ Library Archives, formerly the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they've allowed us to uh, include this in our volume with uh, high-resolution photographic images of the entire document. And uh, that's a symbol of the great cooperation we've had with the Community of Christ. Most of the Joseph Smith papers are right here in Salt Lake City uh, at the Church History Library. But there's also a substantial collection of the Community of Christ, and we're grateful for all their uh, cooperation with us. And, and there's other Joseph Smith documents from coast to coast, and we've done our best to find all of those uh, and include them in the document series. Um, I'll say one more thing about this document. Um, so, as Matt said, this was written in Greenville, in between Missouri and Ohio, and symbolizes that theme he mentioned about the, pro the problem of the distance in the church. So not only do you have the communication problems between Ohio and Missouri, but you have the, the, uh, tr the travel between, and in this case, getting stuck in the middle in Greenville, Indiana. So I'll pass that around. Fantastic letter. Okay, Exhibit B from Documents Volume 2. Um, I, so I, I brought, got that letter, and then I've got uh, a list of uh, charges or complaints of, by the Ohio elders against the Missouri elders. And then I also brought this document with, which is a bishop's license, or maybe it isn't, but <laughs> that just represents, in a small, in a very small capsule, that represents the diversity of documents you'll find in uh, Document Swine 2. So going back to Exhibit B here, uh, this again kind of, kind of uh, is an emblem of this theme that we have a problem of the church being divided between Ohio and Missouri. And the Brethren in Missouri held a conference in early 1832 and sent the minutes uh, to Ohio. And when they received in Ohio and reviewed, some of the Brethren there were not happy uh, with the way that business had been conducted in Missouri. And so in this document, they list what their problems are. And you look, it's in the handwriting of Sidney Rigdon, the body of the document. And then you get to the, the back and, and you have these signatures. These are the guys who signed on to this document. And these are all original signatures, not right here, but this document, uh, the real document. Sidney Rigdon, Jesse Gauze, the elusive Jesse Gauze, David Whitmer, Peter Whitmer Jr., Hiram Smith, and Reynolds Cahoon. Just an amazing collection of original signatures on this document. This is a, this is very little, this has been a very little known document uh, until just recently. I think Mark Staker uses this in his book and it's in Doctors <laughs> Volume 2. Um, well this is, another interesting thing about this document is when you look at these signatures on the back and these guys and you realize, okay wait a minute, these first four guys, Cindy Rigdon, Jesse Goss, David Whitmer, and Peter Whitmer Jr., they are apparent, it seems like these are these guys are down in Hiram on the John and Alice Johnson farm with Joseph Smith. They're down there in Hiram, Ohio, 30 miles to the south of Kirtland. And then these last two names, Hiram Smith and Reynolds Cahoon, well, those guys are back up in Kirtland. 
So when you just look at this document, you're like, oh, okay, you know, Sidney Rigdon wrote this out, and he showed it to these guys, and they all signed it. We, we, can't, we can't put all of these guys together in the same place at the same time. So digging deeper into the historical context, it seems like what probably happened was that Sidney Rigdon uh, wrote this up, and had it signed by uh, the guys around him, and then travels and has the rest of the men sign it. Um, now, if we look at it a little bit closer textually, there's something really interesting here, which is that if you look at the folding of the document, if you look at, and I'll pass this around also, if you look at the Peter Whitmer <coughs> Jr. signature, you can see that transverse of the signature, transverse of the, of the fold over on this side, there's ink transfer from the Peter Whitmer Jr. signature, showing that it was folded like this when the ink on his signature was still wet. So I think a plausible reconstruction here is that, and he's the last of the four guys from the Hiram area, so I think a plausible reconstruction here is that those four sign, and then it's immediately folded up. It's folded like this to pocket size and carried to Kirtland, and then signed by the last two, Hiram Smith and Reynolds Cahoon. Um, so that's kind of fun. I'll pass that around. And then we have this document. Um, I think this this had a this is not in its original folding. Uh, in this document and several other documents, there's more than one folding scheme. And what happens a lot of times is you have kind of an original folding for its original purpose, whatever that may be. But then when it when it changes from what its original purpose was to an archival or records or storage purpose, then it's folded in kind of a standard filing fashion. And right now, this is in that folding, which is usually a trifold or, or a folded half over and half again. And I can never get like lengthwise and widthwise straight in my mind. The more I think about it, the more confused I am. But my kids at school, they fold stuff, like in grade school. And if they fold it this way, they call it hot dog, and they call this hamburger. So, and that's, there's no confusion there. So anyway, the way they usually do it is hamburger, and then, and then, uh, well, now that it's this way, hamburger again, okay? And then they write a little notation up here, and then you, and then you bind these together in a stack, with, tie them up in string, and you can kind of just flip through them and see all these little dockets. They're called dockets. These little notations to tell you what it is. And this one says, Bishop's License. And um, we think this is Edward Partridge's handwriting. It's hard to tell for sure because it's such a small sample. But we think it's Edward Partridge's handwriting. And it apparently came into what's now the Joseph Smith Collection from a donation from the Partridge family. Okay, so what's on here? Um, this is a statement that Edward Partridge has been ordained by the church as the bishop of the church, uh, which of course happened in February of 1831. And that's stated here, the body of this document is also in the handwriting of Sidney Rigdon. And then again, just an astounding collection of signatures, original signatures. Sidney Rigdon, Joseph Smith Jr., Oliver Cowdery, William W. Phelps, Martin Harris, Isaac Morley, Peter Whitmer Jr., Sidney Gilbert, Joseph Coe, Simeon Carter, Hiram Smith, William E. McClellan, Harvey Whitlock, David Whitmer, John Coral, Samuel Dollinger, Peter Dustin, Asa Dodds, Orson Pratt, and John Whitmer. Those are all original signatures. Incredible. Um, th there isn't anything else like this. And this, this is also a document that uh, has not been used much. Um, 
So, digging further into the historical context, um, is this really a bishop's license? Well, it doesn't look like any of the other early licenses that we have. Okay? And uh, including Edward Partridge's own elder's license. Okay, and Edward Partridge is ordained a bishop in February of 1831. <clears throat> but again, digging into the, deeper into the historical context, you look at these men who signed this, again, you cannot put all of these men in the same room at the same time. And Bob Woodford, who's one of the co-editors on Documents 1 and 2, is the first one who started doing this analysis and showed that you look at this first set of signatures, and these were all men who were present in a conference in Missouri in early August of 1831. And then you have another block of kind of a group of men who are together in a conference later in the month. But at that same time, Orson Pratt and some of these other guys haven't arrived in Missouri yet. Okay? And then they leave later in the year. So they must have signed this later in the year. They get there later in the year, and they leave later in the year. John Whitmer, the last signatory, doesn't even arrive until uh, January of the year after. Okay? So th there's really much more of a history of going, going on here. And... Um, I get. I think uh, th I could go on and on about what the significance of this document is uh, when we put it in this later context. It could be related to uh, the recommends that they're supposed to get, enabled to be able to get permits to be able to go into the Indian land. And there's a fascinating possibility about what this document may mean, and I invite you, invite you all to look that up in Documents Volume Two and read about it. But for now, I'll just make a point. I just like to make a point with uh, this and the other documents that documents are not always what they appear to be on their face. When we dig more into them in terms of the historical context and doing more textual analysis, uh, we, we find out that there's more of a story behind them. And I'll end with that. And I'll pass that around. Take any questions that anyone has. I got one real quick. Mark, what's the provenance of that second item you showed us? Question from Chris is what's the provenance of the uh, second item that I showed, which is the charges document? And that document is in the uh, church's ecclesiastical records because um, um, it's related to discipline. And um, I and I'm not sure I can't track it through the years. My assumption is that that document has remained in church custody uh, continually. So this would have been the first time it would have been made. But it would have been published, right? Because those records are not available for research. I, I believe that's true. This is the first time the full text has been published. <clears throat> Baffled. I got a question. For yeah, you. please. On your volumes, uh, volumes one and two goes to 1833 or 32. Yeah, Volume 1 goes uh, up through June of 1831. Volume 2 goes from July 1831 through January of 1833. Okay. Uh, when was Joseph Smith's uh, second wife uh, taken? Was it in 1833? Do you know? I'll take that one. I'll give it a shot. The uh, question was, when did Joseph Smith marry his second wife, his first plural wife? Um... That's that's hotly debated, um, even even to now, and um, one of the questions is uh, did is whether Fanny Auger was a plural wife or not, and I'll just refer you to an essay in this book by Don Bradley that collects all of the evidence for that. Uh, there's there's lots of different sources that imply that. Of course, the, the major question, questioning of that is always falling back on 
um, Oliver Cowdery's letter to his brother where he says, uh, where he complains about this nasty, filthy affair between Joseph Smith and Fanny Auger. Um, of course, uh, the original the original word there is scrape, and then it's replaced with affair. And today, when we read that, we we read into an extramarital affair, which isn't necessarily the case, and not even the original word, which is scrape, which means like trouble. And uh, clearly, the Fanny Auger Joseph Smith relationship caused some trouble. Um, and uh, Oliver Cowdery calls it filthy, nasty trouble. But it's unclear what exactly that means because clearly Oliver Cowdery does not accept plural marriage. He rejects the principle of plural marriage. And so he's going to uh, describe that relationship in this way. So, and again, there's, there's nothing contemporaneous uh, that is explicit. All we're working with is uh, later later reminiscences and accounts, but I would argue that there was a marriage there, and, and I think that's what you're talking about, right? Well, I'm talking just, about Fanny Auger? Yeah, I, I okay. understand she was a second wife, but I'm just wondering throughout your, your research, are you finding anything that Joseph Smith wrote concerning her or concerning any of his other plural wives? Okay, that's a really good question. The question is, throughout our research, are we finding out more about more of things that Joseph Smith wrote about her or about other plural wives? That's a great question. Um, and the answer is, basically, for the most part, no. Uh, the record is very silent because uh, plural marriage was kept secret at this time. As you know, it, didn't, it uh, wasn't publicly announced until we got out here. Well, what I'm thinking is, uh, in your research up to 1833, I don't think he started his uh, his marrying until after 1833 or 1834. So there's probably no record of it, like you say. Right, and and there and there's hardly anything after that as well. Even in um, the middle Nauvoo years, when Joseph Smith is marrying several women, there's very very little. There's a few notes in his journal, just a few, and, and that's about it. In terms of the Joseph Smith papers, there is the William Clayton diary, and there are a few other contemporaneous sources, um, but in Joseph, the Joseph Smith papers, there's very, very little, uh, and there's nothing about uh, the, the mid-1830s and the Fanny Alger relationship. Do the annotations in these two volumes tie into the history of the church that was published to show how they were you know, massaged, reworded? I mean, do, do you deal with that in the actual comparing to the history of the church? You know? I, th I think probably the history of the church is one of the sources that we've analyzed probably more than probably any other source. Maybe the journals are, are probably the primary thing, but. Um, the history of the church is, I, I would say, all of the papers will be dependent on, upon that as uh, one of the primary sources that we use. Um, and so um, the history of the church, we've really tried to come to a balanced uh, opinion about the church. But you certainly see it in many of the footnotes because it's, it's such a big source. Um, but it's been a mixed case. Um, there are certain things that we feel like you can really trust, and then there are certain circumstances where we have good reason to stop and say, now, is this James Mulholland entering in here? Um, is this a reminiscent account that reflects an 1838 version of something? Um, and, and I think that's a question you have to ask over and over with the history of the church, is, is um, what's he trying to get at here? But uh, I think largely when you look at the history of the church, the way it's compiled, you see Mulholland's draft, first of all, where you get these, it's, it's almost like this in-between uh, connective matter from, that will lead a reader from one revelation to the next revelation. Um, and so knowing the structure of the, of the history of the church, you can largely begin to see as he's writing a history based upon when he received these revelations, um, you can begin to pick apart some of the annotation and wonder at some points, is this Joseph Smith 
how much is Joseph Smith involved with that particular case? And so I, in, in my own experience, especially in D1, um, it, Joseph Smith's history is the only, is the only account, right? Um, and, and so it, you really come to a point where what is Joseph Smith saying? What is was he trying to do with his history at, at each point when I'm using it? Um, and and so, uh, but overall, I think Joseph Smith's history is a very trustable um, source. Uh, but you have to be very careful with it, just like any other source, you know. And we treat it just like any other source. There's been a tendency to sort of. Uh, turn it into something grander than it really is, as if this is the inspired version of what the his, what happened in the history. If you read it really carefully, you'll, you'll realize that, that it, it is similar to other sources. It suffers from interpretation. Um, it suffers from this reminiscent uh, perspective. Uh, it also is very heavy when you talk about linguistic shifts, especially things like priesthood, um, where you realize that... <clears throat> Like he's speaking in an 1838 voice, um, and interpreting things that happened in the past that haven't been written down in many cases, and he's trying to get it right. It's it's a careful history. They he doesn't just let it go, and you can count on that Joseph meant many of it because you many of the things that he said because you have these three very distinct versions where Joseph has a chance, and in between there's a published version that comes out, and so in, in that case I think. I think you've hit on probably one of the very most important sources. Yeah, I just uh, point out one other thing that just uh, came across using the, the manuscript history of the church and documents volume two. Um, we often, when we talk about uh, DNC 61, uh, where it talks about um, you know not traveling on the water, and we mention in that about William W. Phelps having the vision of the destroyer riding on the face of the water. Well, where does that come from? It comes from the manuscript history of the church. The interesting thing is, is that if you look at uh, the two contemporary accounts that we have of uh, the journey that Joseph and other elders were taking when this revelation uh, was dictated, um, so you have Ezra Booth uh, writing letters about that journey, and then you have Reynolds Cahoon keeping a journal about it. Neither of those two mention anything about Phelps receiving this vision of the destroyer on the water. And you would think that if that had happened, Booth certainly would have mentioned that. I mean, Booth's, you know, mentioning all, all kinds of things that are going on um, on that trip. So then it makes you wonder, well, how did this get into the manuscript history? And the interesting thing is that portion of the history that talks about uh, this is in Phelps's hand. So Phelps himself is the one that's putting that in there saying, you know, William W. Phelps or myself had this vision of the destroyer riding on, on, the, on the face of the water. So I think that's just one example of when you're using the history of the church, um, the manuscript history about how you know, we need to use other sources around it to try to corroborate what it's saying and use it with a little bit of skepticism because it is a reminiscent account, largely. Can I tell a Phelps story real quick? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a Phelps story. Okay, in the manuscript history of the church, there's a, a, a passage for a day in 1838 when, um, and it, said, it reads that uh, Joseph Smith... Um, chastised William W. Phelps and John Whitmer for their errors, uh, for which they uh, repented the very same day. Uh, this passage is based on Joseph Smith's journal from the same period, and if you look in the journal, it says the same thing. Except, if, if you look at it a little bit closer, you can see that it didn't originally say that. Uh, originally it said, Joseph Smith rebuked John Whitmer and William W. Phelps for their sins. And sins has been knife erased and replaced with errors and the insertion made for which they repented the very same day. Uh, uh, do you want to guess whose handwriting that's in? So, can we blame Phelps then for the fact that us old timers couldn't go swimming on our missions? You, you can blame him for that and more. <laughs> Mike, do you have any Bill Phelps stories? <laughs> In the book, do you do you just present the documents, or do you make some editorial comments and like conclusions, like 
you've done? Sure. Each each document in the book has a historical introduction that puts it in its own context, um, where we try to talk about why the document was produced, uh, how the document was transmitted, how the document was received. Those those kinds of questions, and then. Throughout the document, there's annotation uh, explaining various aspects uh, so of the document. That's the document. That's the footnotes. Yeah. So it's usually heavily footnoted. I think we we try not to insert a lot of our own interpretations in there, but being historians, that's kind of part of what we do. Uh, so I think we we try to present as balanced of a history as we can surrounding the document you know, giving all sides that, that we can see of it. Um, we try not to engage in a lot of uh, his, historiographic debate um, with things that, that have been written before because we'd rather have these documents kind of be out there and have other historians come and interpret them for themselves. But certainly as we're providing the context, that is a form of interpretation as well. Can I address that? Yeah. <coughs> So uh, along those lines, and maybe to clarify just a little more on that. Um, now, it, it is true that in Documents Volume 1, uh, the annotation is fairly heavy. And um, to a large extent, that's a product of the, the dearth of, uh, his, uh, of contemporaneous documents. And so there's a and and because you have these very early revelations and these these kind of foundational moments, and uh, the fact of the matter is that the documents in Document Volume One um, are kind of mysterious in in many regards and and hard to understand and and don't have a lot of context, and it's for that reason that we've, we've kind of there's kind of been a demand to have more annotation to try to explain the, the various things that it might be. It's actually kind of a special case. Um, if you look at the other volumes in the Joseph Smith papers, you'll, you will see less annotation. And like Matt said, we, we are trying to avoid commentary. Uh, we, I'd say we largely succeed in avoiding commentary. We're, uh, we're, we're not really um, geared for uh, heavy historical interpretation. That's not what we're trying to do. Um, we're really kind of approaching the documents, not as historians, but as documentary editors. And so we're asking specific kinds of, of document-based questions, like, like Matt said, why, what motivated the creation of this document? How was this document produced? Whose handwriting is it? Is it Joseph Smith himself? Is it one of his scribes? Is it made, done by assignment? Um, when was this document created? There's lots of dating issues, and that and that's that's tightly related to the document itself as a document, and that's why we engage in that kind of analysis. Um, where was the document created? And again, and again, like Matt said, uh, you know, how is this? How and when was this document transmitted and received? Those are the kinds of um, questions that we are asking, uh, trying to cover as we present the documents. Um, were you uh, were you able to find any documents at all uh, prior to when Joseph Smith decided to become a prophet? I'm not sure. I know what you're talking about. When when do your documents start? What uh, what year? And were you able to find any uh, earlier documents? Um, so. Uh, the, the documents that we have in the volume, it, it begins, uh, so it begins really in 1828. Um, and so we also have a couple of documents that are 18, we have one that's 1827, well we have a couple that are 1827 that are in the, in the appendix in D1. Um, and those are ones that we're not positive that they're Joseph Smith documents, but we, we have a pretty good idea that they are, so we put them in the appendix. And then we also have the Money Diggers Agreement, um, which is an 1824 document. 1826. Oh, excuse me, 1826 document. Um, and so, with with that in mind, uh, that really what happens, um, we there's indications that he's you know he has certain experiences like like the first vision, for example. 
but he doesn't record those. Um, he doesn't record specific uh, occurrences. Like we have BNC 13 that we have now, which is just an extract from the history of the church. And those aren't included because they're not documents that were created in that period. Um, so the, the place that it begins with um, is 1828, um, when he actually gets scribes, when there uh, begins to be documents produced. Um, but before that time, you know, we're pretty sure that the, the Money Diggers Agreement, for example, which has uh, awful provenance, there is a good chance that it is forged. But it, the con context around it demonstrate that it's, you know, it's probably not. There's at least some sort of root of reality that's in that particular document. It, it's my understanding that Elder G. Smith might have had some documents. Uh, are, are you aware of what's, what's become of those, or whether there was anything there that's uh, I think he interest? just recently turned most of it over to BYU. They have a small museum and m many of his documents now. But there was a point when the Joseph Smith... coming to the church as well. Right. Yeah. But w wasn't there a point when Eldridge came in to the Joseph Smith papers, talked with you guys, and he brought the box? Uh, he came to, not to the Smith papers, but to the uh, church history library. Okay. Yeah. What are they on? <clears throat> what are they on? Yeah, what, what kind of things are they? What are they about? What are they about? Oh, the elder, the elder hat. Um. <clears throat> well, um, I'm just taking a guess that maybe are you talking about the uh, astrological parchments that are in that collection? Yeah, that's that's. Is that what you that's had in mind? That's a possibility there. Yeah. Um, the, um, so Mike Quinn has written, I think, as much about those as anybody, um, and, um, he explores some parallels between the content of those manuscripts and, uh, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and things like that. Um, so that's certainly a possibility, and those have been passed down in the Smith family. Uh, not in the Joseph Smith family, not in the Joseph Smith Jr. family, but in the Hiram Smith family. And uh, we really don't know when those came into the family. They could have come in at any time between now, between the 70s or the 60s, and the flood. I don't know. Um, so we, we don't even know for sure really that those ever belong to Hiram Smith or to Joseph Smith Sr. Um, if they did, uh, they may have had some meaning or use for Joseph Smith and Quinn explores those possibilities, but again, uh, we don't know if the Smith family had those and if they did, they were passed down through the Hiram line and not the Joseph Smith line. So that is not the kind of thing that we would publish. That doesn't really rise, meet the bar for what we would include as a Joseph Smith document. And the Community of Christ doesn't have any earlier documents either as far as you know? No, not Joseph Smith papers. You indicated that the church has opened up their archives so that you gentlemen can do your research. After that is done, what is their involvement? Have they, do they review and have they put their stamp of approval on the uh, publications? Sure, so the papers project, although part of our funding comes from Larry Miller, part comes from the church as well, and we're actually housed in the, in the church history library. Uh, so we are a church sponsored uh, project in that way. Um, there is a rigorous review process that these volumes go through, um, including uh, several general authorities review the volumes. Uh, when you say general the, authorities, published. does it get clear up to the apostle level? It does. Uh, it actually also goes through a first presidency review as well. Um, and so they are reviewed uh, and 
once they go through that review and they're published, then they have the, the church's approval uh, to be published. And the Church Historians Press, which publishes these, that's also a church-sponsored uh, publisher as well. So. I, w I want to just add to that that um, in addition, uh, the church has provided funding, institutional support, and we ha do have this, we, we work for the church, and of course the leaders of the church consider themselves the successors of Joseph Smith and care about this project and want to take a look at it before they pay to publish it. I, I want to add that we also have an advisory board made up of scholars who do not belong to the church. And we look to their review uh, to catch us on points of bias or using uh, insular Mormon language or things like that. And that's a, and that's a stellar cast of advisors. We have uh, Skip Stout, who's the Jonathan Edwards professor at Yale University, and he's the editor of the Jonathan Edwards papers there. We have um, Stephen Stein, who uh, wrote the book on the Shakers, and is considered by many the expert on uh, alternative religion in American religious history. We have uh, Sue Perdue, who co-authored The Bible of Documentary Editing, The Guide to Documentary Editing. And we also have Terrell Givens, who is a Latter-day Saint on that so advisory board. Larry Maffley Kip, we just added her. We just added Lori Maffley Kip, who's a great scholar of Mormonism and uh, American religious history, not LDS. Um, Mike touched on this in regards to the uh, money digging agreement, but when the Joseph Smith Papers people are faced with questions about the authenticity of documents that you choose to include in the project. How do you arrive at a consensus? Does it have to be unanimous? Are there like minority voices or dissident voices among the Papers people? How do you decide what what to include when you have to answer those kinds of questions? Minority voice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like any any group of historians, there's points at which you're not going to agree. Um, and some of these, are they, it takes a long time to grind it out. This, this story I told you about, DNC 19, we brought in everybody we could possibly think of to come in and to we'd present it to them and they would argue with us. It was a, a rigorous review. Um, and it took a long time to come and, and sort of grind down and make sure that we had the GUI center. Um, and uh, I would say uh, the the biggest critics that we have are usually people on the Joseph Smith papers. Um, you have someone like like Ron Esplin, who is the heart of the of the Joseph Smith papers, um, who is probably I I would estimate is one of the very best editors and critical minds in the whole church, um, and he is always a very very hard person to convince. He, he refuses to let you go on unless you've got it right. And this sometimes there's a bit of contention where we're, we're trying to figure out what it is. Um, but, you know, we've, we've, our general editors are very rigorous. But in particular, when we read our own stuff and we're discussing it back and forth, largely there's usually two individuals that are driving the volume. And those two people battle it out. And then it expands from there. With, with D1 in particular, me and Garrett added up the number of reviews that we had, and it was over 40. Um, and so, you know, it's, they're peer-reviewed beyond what they possibly, any other volume is possibly peer-reviewed. And there definitely is, dis, like, people that disagree. There, there's always those disagreements. And sometimes you have to get to a point where something that you're presenting, sometimes it has to be, far more descriptive of what a document says rather than arguing what it means. Because there are times when you can't get at what it actually means. And the only way you can go to that is through a, a specific argument. One argument versus the other argument. Um, and, and so I think there are points at which the, the very most powerful argument is to say, here's what the documents say. And, and that's largely what we're relying on. So. Dissension, disagreement, absolutely. There, there certainly is. Um, and after the process, I think you get to the point where 
and, and you guys can chime in as so, so, so the volume editors are basically responsible for navigating through all those different opinions regarding the documents in each volume? Yes, sure. Yeah. We also have a document selection committee that uh, meets regularly to consider what is a Joseph Smith document, what's not. That's made up of historians on, on the project. Um, and oftentimes volume editors will come to that committee with an argument as to whether something should be included or something should not be included, and then it's discussed among the committee and, and a decisions made there. Well, Mark volunteered that he was a minority voice. <laughs> Would you I wouldn't say, say that. that. <laughs> well, sure, I'll just tell you the story. I'll just tell you a story on the Money Diggers Agreement. Um, I wrote my master's thesis on, on the 1820s, Joseph Smith's early years, and his use of seer stones, his acquisition of seer stones. And so this had always been an interesting document to me, and I had studied it uh, uh, historiographically. And, uh, you know, Dale Morgan, years and years ago, um, in a book that was published by Signature Books, hat tip to Signature Books, uh, showed how the names of the people in the Money Diggers Agreement check out. They were local people. They were Susquehanna folks. And so I, I thought it was a legitimate document. And the main, I could probably say this, I think I would say this. The main person uh, who didn't want to include the Money Diggers Agreement was Jeff Johnson. And Jeff Johnson's, so my, I was coming at it from historical context of my trainings in history. Jeff Johnson is an archivist, and he's looking at where it comes from, which it, it comes from a, a, a late newspaper source, which claims to be getting it from another newspaper that no longer exists. And it, it, it's published, like, at the very end of the 19th century, I think. Um, uh, and, and what is it again? Salt Lake Tribune. Salt Lake Trib. Is it a trip? Mm -hmm. From the Salt Lake Tribune. So, pretty stinky custodial history, I had to admit. And uh, the compromise was, okay, well, you know, okay, so maybe it isn't a Joseph Smith document, but maybe it is, and so we included it in, as an appendix. Yeah, one of the, what, one of the convincing points that I, uh, when I worked on the document was, the point, you have this commentary, and then you actually have the document that's reproduced. And when you look at the commentary, it tries to sell Joseph Smith as a certain type of person. And when you get into the document, um, it's very clear that it's a different voice. Um, you have commentary that sort of disregards Joseph. But then you have this contract um, that looks similar to other contracts. Um, it has, we, we extended the number of people we could identify on the document, and it, they're these legitimate people. And the document itself contradicts what is said in the commentary. And so to stop and say, this is a forgery, you would then have to say, well, there's a forgery that then someone commentated. Um, and so for me, that's a sticking point where you have to say, there is something valid about this contract. Um, and the problem is still, though, if you can't track the provenance of a document, um, there is a huge issue. If you don't have provenance, you have to stop and say, where did this thing come? Especially with the problem of, of forgery in, in the Mormon church. You have to stop and ask the question. I, we have demonstrable forgeries as early as Nauvoo. Um, and so, it, well, you're talking about a real big issue, but... Um, we largely came down on the side that this is likely a real document, but we're not willing to say it because there's zero provenance. And forgers can fool you. There's no doubt about it. Can I answer to that, Gary? Um, most of the time when we're trying to decide whether or not to include something in the volume, it's not because we question the authenticity of the document. It's more a question of whether or not it really counts as a Joseph Smith document. And as we mentioned, as you know, Joseph Smith did very little of his own writing. He's mostly involving scribes and clerks, and this kind of develops into a, a kind of informal, uh, indirect clerical staff. And then you have 
a hiring of attorneys who are doing things on behalf of Joseph Smith, and you have church agents, and you and you get into all these issues of, and you know you have things that are kind of written by assignment, maybe with direction, maybe not. So you have all these different kinds of possibilities of how close to Joseph Smith is this really? And you know sometimes it's we're we're actually quite liberal if you compare what we're doing to other major documentary editing projects in terms of what we include. But we do have to draw a line somewhere because there's a lot of gray space there. This will have to be the last one. Will there be any volumes published in 2014? Yeah, in December of 2014, Documents Volume 3 will be published. So that's the next one coming out. Thank you very much.